For my thoughts on all the latest happenings in the NFL in a completely relaxed, unscripted format, be sure to check out my channel, JG9 News. And now, on with our feature presentation. By virtue of playing in the NFC West, every single year for over a decade and a half, minus 1982 due to the strike screwing everything up, the Atlanta Falcons play the Los Angeles Rams over at Anaheim Stadium. And over the course of their time at Anaheim Stadium, they played in quite a few memorable games. You had the Monday Night Football game in 1981, when the Rams delivered the nail in the coffin on Atlanta's playoff chances, thanks to a go-ahead, fourth-quarter touchdown run by Wendell Tyler to win the game 21-16. You had the iconic 1984 thriller, where the lead changed hands three times in the fourth quarter, with the Falcons winning it on a walk-off, 37-yard field goal by Mick Luckhurst with no time left to win their first game in Los Angeles ever, winning their first game there in 17 tries against the Rams. You had the 1983 battle, where the Falcons led it 21-14 in the fourth quarter before the Rams took the lead on a touchdown pass by Vince Ferragamo with 17 seconds left to win it 27-21. And you had the very first meeting at Anaheim Stadium between these teams, the regular season finale in 1980, where the Rams won it in overtime on a walk-off field goal by kicker Frank Corral that probably saved his career. You can learn more about that by clicking the card in the upper right corner. Basically, when you play a lot of games at a venue, there are going to be some that stand out and live on in NFL history. And the Falcons definitely saved the weirdest one for last, I'll put it that way because the final game that the Falcons ever played at this venue right here was in 1994, before the Rams left Anaheim to move to St. Louis. Because the final game that the Falcons ever played at this venue right here is remembered three decades later for two other notable reasons besides it just being Atlanta's final game at the venue. Number one, the game ended in a scorigami. Granted, it ended in one of the weirdest and sloppiest scorigamis of all time, but it was a scorigami nonetheless, as this score has never happened again. But number two, the way the Falcons got to the game? Oh man, we didn't even know if the game was going to take place. That's how bad it was. Because this game involved a bus driver going completely rogue and getting questioned by officials afterwards for holding the team hostage. It's actually kind of a miracle that the Falcons were able to win their final game at Anaheim Stadium considering everything that they went through. But we're taking a deep dive into that today, because it is truly bizarre. Because this is the story behind what has to be, considering the circumstances, the worst bus ride in the near 60-year history of the Atlanta Falcons franchise. Before I talk about the actual incident in question, we need some context to understand the importance of the game at hand. It's October 2nd, 1994. It's week 5 of the NFL season, and as we head into the second quarter of the year, we've got an NFC West battle on our hands between the Atlanta Falcons and the Los Angeles Rams. For the main team in our story, the Falcons, this is a big game for them, as they find themselves at 2-2. Two and two. Not only are they looking to sweep the season series, having defeated the Rams 31-13 in their first meeting back in week 2 in Atlanta, but they're looking to get above 500 for the first time all season. And that's a big deal. Of the six teams to make the playoffs in the NFC in 1993, five of them were above 500 after six games. So the difference between 3-2 three and 2-3 and two and three might not seem like a lot early on in the season with 11 games to go, but it definitely meant something. So the Falcons had to have a good game plan to defeat the Rams, in terms of not just on the field, but arriving to the stadium as well. And for the Falcons, and for any NFL team for that matter, preparation is key. Every single team has a pregame routine that they go through, and every single player has something that they do to get ready for the game. You have to change, you have to loosen up and stretch, you have to practice plays, and if you're a specialist, you have to get a lot of reps in, whether that be punting the ball or kicking the ball. And that was the plan for the Falcons here. The game was supposed to start at 4 o'clock Eastern, so 1 o'clock on the West Coast. And the plan for the Falcons was to arrive at the venue at 10 o'clock local time, so 3 hours before the game. That is pretty standard procedure. And for the Falcons, 
this should not have been a problem in the slightest bit, seeing as they were staying at the Hyatt Regency in Anaheim, a mere two miles away from the stadium. They were staying close by, so if you leave the hotel at 9.50, you're there by 10 o'clock, no problem whatsoever. Now I cannot stress enough how easy of a drive this is. We all get lost every now and then and don't know where we're going. And this was especially true back in 1994 when we didn't have GPS and we didn't have MapQuest and we had to rely on paper maps. However, that didn't apply here, as considering the number of turns you had to make and considering the signage everywhere, you had to literally try to get lost on your way to Anaheim Stadium from the High Regency. Here's how it looks on Google Maps. You make a left turn on Haster Street, and then you make a right on Gene Autry Way, and boom, you're at the stadium. Santa Claus didn't need Rudolph's help for this one. And I'm about to show you via Google Earth how incredibly easy this is, because you're not going to believe how easy and simple this commute is. It's basically the simplest commute any team has ever had. It's not like the Falcons were staying 30 minutes away and there was construction on the roads, so they had to take a detour, or they were staying in a different city. No, they were staying, for all intents and purposes, as close to the stadium as you can possibly be. There's no major roads to go on, no weird exits to get off of that sneak up on you, none of that. It's a left turn and a right turn. A six-year-old knows how to get there, and what that means. Which raises the ultimate question. How the hell do you wind up in Long Beach? This was supposed to be a 10 minute run tops, and the bus driver somehow ended up in Long Beach over 26 miles away. For some perspective on how far away that is, imagine that this was back in the early 1980s and you were going to a New York Jets game at Shea Stadium. But instead, you accidentally wound up at Giants Stadium in a different state. At 21 miles, that is still somehow less lost from a mile standpoint than this bus driver was. Or imagine if you're staying at a hotel in downtown Baltimore. You ask the driver to take you to M&T Bank Stadium for the Ravens game, and he ends up taking you to the Naval Academy. This wasn't just, oh, I got lost and made a wrong turn. This might be the world's worst driver to the point where you think this was completely 100% intentional. It is impossible to accidentally go from a hotel two miles away from the stadium and wind up 26 miles away in Long Beach, a completely different city where you have to see the signs for Long Beach and presumably have to get on a major road in order to get there. And to say that the Falcons were livid about this would be an understatement. It's one thing to get lost. That happens, we're all human, everybody makes mistakes. But it's another to wind up in a completely different city for something that should have been a 10 minute commute tops. Because what should have been 10 minutes turned out to be 70 minutes. As John Knox, who handled the transportation for the Falcons and always used this company when they went to Anaheim with no issues whatsoever beforehand, said on this, once we started getting a good ways away, I told him we got to turn around. Then, we got so turned around and started going all over the place, none of us knew where we were. It was kind of scary, really, because the driver wasn't the same as he was the day before. He threw everything off schedule. Everything was rushed. Everyone was mad. Eventually, the team made it to Anaheim Stadium, albeit an hour later than expected meaning that their warm-ups had to be cut short, and their entire routine had to be altered in a way that was not in the schedule. Knox thought this was sabotage, which makes sense, seeing as there's no sane universe in which a situation like this makes any sense. As Knox said, I find it hard to believe the guy was actually lost. It's not that far to the stadium, and he's got a point. I mean, we literally just took the route a few minutes ago in this video. You have to make a concentrated effort to wind all the way up in Long Beach when it's two turns and no major roads that you have to go off of. And there's probably going to be signage everywhere on game day and traffic cones directing all the madness. So that leaves two questions left to answer. Number one, 
How do the Falcons do despite this unintended hiccup? And number two, what the heck happened to the bus driver? Well, with the Falcons, in no way whatsoever was this scheme pretty, as you can probably tell from all these highlights. Not in the slightest bit. The first time these teams met, as I said before, the Falcons won handily, taking it 31-13. This time, it was an entirely different ballgame, as the Falcons won 8-5. Yes, that is Scorigami, and it has not happened since. A safety by the Rams in the second quarter, a field goal by the Rams in the third quarter, and a fourth quarter touchdown pass and two-point conversion, courtesy of Falcons quarterback Bobby Hebert, as both Rams starting quarterback Chris Chandler and Falcons starting quarterback Jeff George went down due to injuries. Obviously, an 8-5 game is incredibly ugly and not fun to watch for most fans, but it counts all the same. A win is a win, and it was a big one for the Falcons, as it sent them to 3-2 after 5 games. Said head coach June Jones on the win, It seems like everything that could happen to us to cause us to lose did happen. It says something about our guys that they won. The Falcons made it out okay, but what about the bus driver? Amazingly enough, he also turned out okay. The bus driver for Gold Coast Tours that made this simple two-mile drive into an all-out sightseeing tour in a completely different city? He wasn't arrested by the Anaheim Police Department. And he wasn't even fired or suspended or fined by the company. As a spokesman for Gold Coast Tours said, As far as I know, the driver just made a wrong turn. That's it. The NFL checked out the driver when he got to the station, and he was okay. No, he's not in trouble. Alright, time out. A wrong turn? He made a wrong turn? That makes it sound like he missed the exit or made a left when he should have made a right. The man ended up in an entirely different city over 25 miles away. You're not going to punish him at all? You're not going to say, we're sorry about the incident or he won't be driving with us while we conduct an investigation or something along those lines? This wasn't just some mistake. And even if it was, it's a pretty big one! You have one job, and you fail miserably! It's like if I'm at a pizza place, and I'm the only person there, so you can't mix up my order or confuse it with anyone else's, and I ask for a cheese pizza, and the next thing you know, instead of taking 10 minutes, it takes an hour, because the first order they gave me was a pizza with pineapple, blue cheese, anchovies, pepperoni, and mushrooms. Then the guy says that, as far as I know, the man just added a wrong topping. No, he added like 10 in what should have been the simplest order ever. Something went horribly wrong that went way beyond your standard, run-of-the-mill mistake. And what's crazy about the game between these two teams behind me right here is the fact that this isn't even the first time in NFL history that a bus driver just completely failed at their job and went completely rogue and had no idea where they were going, and they forced the road team to arrive at the stadium way later than expected. A quarter century before that game, or roughly, in 1970, there was an incident involving these two teams behind me right here, the Buffalo Bills and the New York Giants. The game was supposed to be played at 1 o'clock Eastern at Yankee Stadium. You know what time the Bills got to the stadium? 12.50, 10 minutes before kickoff. And that's because the bus driver was supposed to pick the team up from the hotel and he got lost on his way to the hotel, which led to complete chaos and the Bills not getting there anywhere near game time. You can learn more about that by clicking the card in the upper right corner, because I did a video on that a long time ago. Who knew there were multiple stories and multiple incidents, and so many stories for that matter, of a bus driver just completely failing at his job when it comes to an NFL team? Go figure. The odd part about this is that after this game, the Falcons had five row games for the remainder of the 1994 season, and they lost all five of them. If they didn't go 0-5 in their final five row games, they would have made a playoff push. But presumably, in all five of those games, they arrived on time to the stadium and went through their usual pregame routine. The best they played on the road might have legitimately been the game when the bus driver had no idea how to get to the stadium and the team arrived late. So maybe there was something to the bus driver's madness. Maybe the bus driver had the right idea by making sure the team couldn't get there on time. Who knows? 
Because on this day in 1994, the Falcons didn't just have a long drive at the end of the game. They had an awfully long drive before that as well. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.